we typically will bring things up. In fact, with notice, it can be about anybody. We have a, a special viewing area. You tell us what it is yeah. you'd like to see. We have uh, over 18,000 works in the collection. Any given time, there's only a few you can show, which means if somebody needs to see something, um, let us know, we'll bring it up. Yeah. We'll let you see it. The reason I'm fatter is just because I'm just shorter. Yeah, no, is that is that where I don't as a as a physician, I'm not sure that's true. <laughs> you are a doctor, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you really? Yeah, that's what's medicine man. Yep. Seriously? Mm hmm I yep. didn't know that. Yeah. What what uh sports medicine, yeah. Really? Uh huh. But do you work with the teams down? I did. There? I did all that stuff. I worked with from pros all the way to just regular, you know. Uh, you and me, Joe, uh -huh. you know, athletes. But. So this was your was your interest and passion, though. So I always thought my dream was being a sports doctor, but then when I got into art world, it was like, oh man, this is so great. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, well, I'm pretty I'm not pretty soon. It was just that's all I could think about, and I got offered a, you know, the job I wanted, which would be working with professional athletes. And then I realized uh -huh. that if I took it, I was going down that rabbit hole, and I said, nah, I think I'm going to pass. <laughs> really? Yeah. Huh. Uh, that was almost 30 years ago. I ha have a background a little bit like that. Oh, yeah. Well, let me yeah. let's uh, introduce you because we okay. are talking now. Ed Lind is here, and Ed came from Provo, Utah. And uh, he just kind of snuck in on us and told, called me yesterday, I think, or I called you yesterday. Uh -huh. And um, he was so gracious to do a, a podcast with me. And so you are the associate director of yes. the Art Museum at BYU. Brigham Young University Museum yep. of Art. There you go. Yeah. And you've been there for a long time, right? I have. Uh, over 22 years. Yeah, that's a long time. It's been a while. So anybody that's from BYU Provo Art Department, I'm going to love because they have the mother load of Maynard Dixon paintings, which we're going to get into because, you know, that's, that's the place. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's hollow ground as far as I'm concerned. Um, not only for me and other people who are into Dixon, but I think also for Dixon as well. We're incredibly fortunate, fortunate to have that as uh, a core piece of our collection. And it, it, it's just remarkable what happened. Yeah, how it got to Provo. Yep. Um, I don't know any any other story like that. I don't know any other. Huh. It. Uh, how to turn thirty seven hundred dollars into probably twenty five million? <laughs> e I, I would say easily. The other interesting thing about it, though, for museums is the significance of the art is the only thing that matters. The uh, value of it is in some ways, almost a liability. It is a liability, actually. We, we take a work of art, people think, well, why would somebody give you a work of art? Right. Um, and um, most often the answer is they want it taken care of in perpetuity. But that's the other side of the equation for us. When we take something, we're now responsible that's for That's right. It. That's a big responsibility. For, from now on. And yes. their expectation is that it'll be shown, and it'll be conserved, it'll be taken care of. We'll find yeah. ways to make it significant. And they're going to share it with everybody if, if something has merited that status. Um, but the, the Harold R. Clark acquisition was probably the best day in BYU's <laughs> Museum of Art history. That's what I think. I think, the, I think it was the, the best day in Western history. Yeah, honestly. yeah, the fact that the, those paintings were purchased and, um, and ended up in Provo. Um, it's just remarkable. We don't have another. Well, we we have another big piece of our collection that came in a similar way. Huh. The Mahanra Young Estate. Uh, he was a uh, an East Coast artist that uh, his estate went to his uh, family, his descendants, and uh, he had Utah connections. And the university purchased. Uh, uh, it was a, a gift partial purchase, and that came. But that's a lot of different artists. Those those were the it was right. the collection of his father in law essentially, jailed and Ware. So the two pieces, the big pieces of the BYU Museum of Art, are the are the uh, Mahanra Young Estate, and the Harold R. Clark, uh, almost miracle purchase, of I believe it's eighty five paintings. Yeah, that's exactly right. It was eighty five paintings. Yeah. In fact, that list you can go to the Sacramento. Um, library the state library and they have mm -hmm. the original 
list in there of all the paintings and the writings. Really? Yep. So you will you can use that for research yeah. when we get there. But let me go back a little. I want to digress because okay. we will talk about that because it is truly an important part of this podcast. Um, it's a great holding. But I want to know a little bit about you and how you got where you are. Because mm-hmm. you were just saying my history is a little bit like yours. In a, in a, a little ten- bit. Where did you grow up? Um, well, I'm originally from Eugene, Oregon. Mm-hmm. Uh, my father was uh, an engineer for the Bureau of Public Roads. So we lived in a number of different places. But uh, um, I uh, I spent my high school years in Boise, Idaho. And uh, and I uh, went to BYU as a student. Mm-hmm. But I didn't go to study art. And what year would have this been when you went? I graduated from high school in 1973. Okay, so the Vietnam War was just winding down, so you just kind of missed that. I did. I I dodged a bullet, maybe not the best phrase. No, but it's but true. But I had a low number, and I would have gotten drafted if, if things didn't start. You know, yeah. the Paris Peace Talks were happening right, right after I graduated, and things started to look like we're going to figure something out. Yeah, and uh, so you, do you remember what your number was? Gosh, I don't remember. Uh, I remember it was concern, although I wasn't that concerned because I think by that time, the general idea was it's winding down. Yeah, it's going to wind down. I probably am not going to get drafted. And, uh, but of course, like you probably remembering those days, uh, it it was on everybody's mind. Oh, it was because tortuous, uh, you know, my, my close friend's brother was shot down in a helicopter over the Mekong Delta, and it was very real. Yeah, you know, there was. Did they, everybody knew people? I did had your a, brothers die? Did his your best friend's brother die? He died. Yeah, yeah. he lost his life, and uh, I had another older uh, a guy that was a neighbor had had severe damage to a leg out from a landmine. So you know, you grow up with these things, right? And and uh, it is heavy on your mind. But it wasn't for me as much because I was younger and uh, things were happening that looked like. Yeah. And you didn't have any brothers that had gone? No, I'm, I'm the oldest uh, um, brother in my family. My, but, but, you know, Mark, I don't know if you felt this way or whether it's a pessimism, but I worried as much about my younger brothers. I thought, well, this one's ending and what's, what's the next one? Yeah. You know, because because we, we grew up with, you know, the draft was a big deal. Oh, and, no, it's true. And you had to decide who you were. You had to decide how you felt about right. things. You had to make big decisions in your life. That's true. And, uh, and it was scary business. Uh, well, it was very scary. My brother was of that age. He graduated in 68. So, uh-huh. you know, we didn't know if he would go or not. So he managed to get a school deferment. But, you know, he would. Yeah. He was, it would not have been in his best interest to. He was a musician, is a musician. To, uh-huh. to try to go into that realm. It, he would have not done well at all. Yeah. I've always thought it was an interesting time, though, that um, that it forced young people like myself to think about. Well, who am I? Future. Yeah. Who am I? Am I somebody who will do this? Yeah. Had I, you made a decision? Had you thought what you would do? I felt extremely conflicted. I, bet. I felt like I wasn't someone who understood completely the issues. I deeply appreciated my heritage and country and freedom. Right. And felt obligations. On the other hand, I couldn't see, like so many people, what this one was all about, and uh, and and so you have to sort it all out. And as we were speaking just a few minutes ago, in a lot of ways, it wasn't sort. You didn't sort it out yourself, right? Somebody told you, right? But then you had to, of course, decide what you're going to do about all that. Yeah. What, and, uh, and what did your dad? Had you your dad have a my conversation? father? My father had served on a submarine chaser in World War II. Yeah. And. Uh, um, but in so you know, in so many ways, it was different. It was oh yeah, different that time. was a completely different thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But you think he would have wanted you to go, or you? Oh, I don't think there'd be any question that you would have. Expected he would have said me. you got to go. Yeah. I don't think there'd been a discussion. Yeah. You know, that's that's what his generation did. Yeah. On the other hand, I think it was an easier question, as you said. Absolutely. You know, what do we need to do? It's pretty pretty clear. It was black. It was more black and white. Yeah. Too. Yeah. You know, world domination versus. 
versus whatever that yeah. quagmire was at that time. And it yeah, was, but but it was such a difficult thing to sort out who these people were and what was going on in the world. Being from Boise, Idaho, yeah, was a different thing too because now I I, I don't know how much truth is in this, but one, uh, Boise has some very large companies. One of them's Morrison Knudsen, mm -hmm. and my understanding was. Part of the reason we were over there was protecting some of Morrison Knudsen's interests in mm. Vietnam. They were building dams or bridges or something. Yeah. I, I don't know all the history of that to speak accurately about it. But you know, when when you live there and you go, really, right? That's what this is about. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, older people are telling you that you know that this is wrong and we're doing things. Now, I, I I I don't really feel that I'm qualified to comment on that part of it, but I think it. I think there is some history in that. And oh, yeah. That particular place raises a different dialogue. Oh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean. Probably a longer answer than you're looking no, for. No, but it's true. I mean, I, I served in the military for nine years and four years active. Uh -huh. and I remember when I, you know, raised my hand, I was thinking, you know, Mark, you're raising your hand. You may end up in something like this. Yeah. Too. Did you do your uh, medical they, they training? Pay, yeah, they paid for the my medical school. So uh -huh. they paid for it. And then you give them four years and then. You also do reserve when you're in school. So um, I'm super glad I'm served, but I'm also glad that I didn't have to see combat because that's uh -huh. that's a different kind of thing that you come away with. Yeah, yeah. well, that was the other side of it, too. The people who came home suffered. Hmm. Oh. Suffered so... They still are, by the way. Still are. Yeah. You know, it was such a... Uh, those, those who, uh, you know, people went for all kinds of reasons, and those who went with good intent came back... Um, Sometimes wondering why they did it, and sometimes wondering yeah. why we didn't understand why they did it. Right. And uh, all, all of it was just complex and difficult. Yeah, I met with a lot of those people, the vets, uh -huh. and uh, in the military as a physician, they would come in, and they were still having real issues. You know, yeah. It took 25 years later. Yeah. And uh, as as the new group is, too, you know, they're, yeah. they're dealing with it as true. well. That's true. I think it's a little different because they're volunteers, and I think that maybe helps in the sense of um, you don't feel like you were forced to do something you didn't want to do. And uh, so, though I don't know, you'd have to, we'd have uh -huh. to talk to them and I'm not serving, uh, you know, as a physician anymore in the, yeah. you know, in the military, but it'd be interesting to see what the feelings are uh, as far as the, the current vets. So, okay, well, we talked, okay. we've gotten the political aspect yeah, out of it, or at least have. part of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's a little interesting today with the serious problems today, on this day, to be talking about those problems Yeah, I mean, back then and how people were reacting to them and trying to make a difference. Yeah, no, we still have, but, you know, there's, we, you know, we've progressed but how far have we progressed? Yeah. That's the question. Yeah, it's been interesting the last few days how serious these things seem. Yes, they are. And uh, and remembering people from that grew up in my my era thinking the same things. These are really serious problems. Yes. And at the time, it wasn't just civil rights. We were dealing with everything. Yes. Yeah, I know. So I the think... same ones as today. You know, we're just as heavy as. This war, the civil rights problems, oh, yeah. and all of that were. We just, had massive racial problems yeah, it, when it, we were growing it, up. As it kids. looked like the world was coming yeah. apart; that there wasn't going to be a future for us. Yeah, no. and in some some ways. And then you go just back a little bit. In 1918, there was 83 lynchings that year. So is that right? It is. Yeah, 19, and that's in 1919. 19, 1919. 1919. Yeah, the, oh, right, you know, gosh. while the pandemic flu is going on, right? After they're coming back from World War, well, uh, the Spanish yeah, flu from World War One. Yeah, there was uh, it was called the Red Wave. Actually, what happened in 1918? You had all the black soldiers coming back, and they were being socially discriminated. Uh -huh. And there was a lot of racial uh, tension going on at that time. Wow. 19. Yeah, there was 83 I, lynchings I, in 1919. I didn't realize that. Yeah. So I mean, there has been progress made. Yeah. But it is a slow grind, and it feels like a grind sometimes. There's an interesting maybe comment I'd make on that a year ago. Probably just about this time I visited Montgomery, mm. Alabama, mm -hmm. where the uh, the monument is there. Right. And, uh, you know, the about the lynchings, and they have the boxes. Every county that had a, a lynching has a, 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 a box hanging mm. with 
the with number the names yeah the names on it wow uh, which is very sobering to see just uh, almost unfathomable yeah to see what kind of a problem this was but the thing that really struck me is they made two sets there's one that's there permanently mm -hmm. and there's a second set that's to be installed in each county where these things took place and those are laying out on the space next to it mm. and as of last year i don't know what's developed so far uh, their expectation is that each county who has had this history will own up to it and take take their box, their, mm. their second, mm -hmm. and install it. And they pay all the costs. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing they ask is there has to be a press release. You have to let people know that you've <laughs> done it. And when I was there a year ago... None, let me guess. Not a single one. Yeah, doesn't surprise me. Not a single county had, had acknowledged... Yeah. Um, I can't explain the reasons for that, hmm. but they feel yeah. ominous. Yes. And they feel manifest. Now, on the other hand, as a positive note, to me anyway, the extent of the messages that have happened in the last few days um, give me some hope that yeah. there are people everywhere in Salt Lake City. Um, we saw things last week that I, I never imagined we would with cars burning and turned right. over. And right. That do, that's that's no. nothing I remember in my lifetime in that area yeah. that people felt that way. 68 convention they did, I think. In Chicago. Yeah. But not in Salt Lake City. Not in Salt Lake. Yeah, no, it's everywhere. Yeah. That, that was what I was really yeah, trying no, to say yeah, is that in Salt no. Lake, um, I was at the um, uh, uh, Scottsdale Museum of the West. Mm-hmm couple hours ago and and uh and um uh, mike fox told me that they had moved some of the paintings in that were in the exhibition there down when they had the um the violence at the, the mall next to yeah so makes sense. Ha happened just next door yeah makes sense you know if, if i were to pick a place that that was going to happen i i may not be sensitive and understand the dynamics of the phoenix area but yeah, you wouldn't think that. I was... didn't think Scottsdale. Yeah, no, they, and they um, had some big issues. They had big issues. I saw some yeah. boards going up in the, you know, old town. And, you yeah, know. yeah, that's where that's where yeah. it is. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and t to me, at least, it tells me. Well, the dialogue is pervasive. Then, yeah, you know, we don't we don't have a country with our eyes closed. And and the thing in Montgomery, maybe in, I don't know, in fairness, but it's so horrific to see it. Yeah. It hurts your heart so badly to see it. I know that I can. Maybe maybe it isn't fair to say. Well, no one's owning up. Well, good grief. It, it kills you. Yeah, Emmett Till's. Try. You know yeah. they have a marker for him in Mississippi, and he gets yeah. shot up every year. Oh my word! I know. So you know, we have some. There's some yeah. serious. There's some serious strife in America. Yeah, and uh, well, we're gonna. You know. We'll, we'll, I, I think this is a pivoting point. I've said that in my mind before, but I think it is a pivoting point. Well, don't um, you think it must be progress? Well, I think it's definitely progress yeah. for sure. When when yeah. people are voicing their concerns, yeah, um, and it's you, not just unilateral; it's a wide swath of yeah, exactly of individuals. That's exactly what yeah, I'm and talking um, about. and the more they can make it peaceful, the more power. That that will, oh, I will know. hold. I, I know. I agree. Yeah. I, uh, I, I've heard. You know, the message in Salt Lake. The uh, uh, director of the Black Lives Matter was on. She said, "You know, this message is so contrary to what's happening on the streets to what we've right we've been trying to communicate, and so destructive to what we're trying to do." And she said, "You know, I don't know these people who did that. Right. They haven't come to our meetings." Right. And she's, she said, I was so impressed with her. She said, if, if one of our members does that, she said, I will testify against you myself <laughs> because that is not what our message was. Right. Right. And um, I was impressed by that. I thought that was uh, quite remarkable. Well, I think the fact that we're spending this much time on this when we're an art podcast. Oh, tell, yes, but, yes. But no, but it tells you that it has merit. It has weight. Yes, it does. That. You know, it overrides everything in America at this moment in time. I hope there's some hope in it. I hope. I hope I it think means so. that uh, we're not going to have to deal with this forever. No. Well, it's. I don't. I. We can't. 
No, we can't. Yeah, because if we don't take some steps, you know, it's going to be a, a continuing problem and will only escalate to more divide. And, yeah. uh, you know, we are supposed to be a country of immigrants and different individuals, and yes. hopefully we'll come together in some form. Yes. All well, right. Now we've covered okay. Vietnam. <laughs> yes, we have. The racial <laughs> diversiveness, which is insane yes. at this moment. We haven't talked about the pandemic. I'm not sure I even want to, because um, <laughs> it's just, you know, it's the ongoing issue. Uh -huh. um, but I would like to find out. So you graduate from 73. Three, you yes, go to I did. you go yeah. to college, yes, and, where did. Did, and you went to BYU. Uh huh. And at that time, were you considering going into art or not? Um, I, I was an art student in high school and loved art. So you were a painter, or uh, I wasn't sure at that yeah. point what, you it was, thought you what were art artist. was going to be for me. Yes, but I loved it, and it was my interest and passion. But I also realized, as I have, uh, that uh, I may not be able to do what I want to in life. Yes trying to make a living doing that. And I had a good friend that uh, told me, he says, well, everybody has to take some accounting. He says, I'm sorry to have to tell you that. Uh -huh. and, but he said, you know, everybody has to do that. And I did. And uh, and I remember him asking, so, so do you, you really hate it, right? Because of my background. I said, I don't hate it. I find it interesting that there's a bit of a puzzle in it. Yeah. And he says, well, then you're a natural. <laughs> as long as you don't hate it, you're yeah. natural. Anyway, I, I, that's what I studied. I studied accounting and finance. And, was uh, there a part of you that whole time going, though, I kind of wish I was painting? Always. You know, yeah, always. Well, I wonder. It was always that. there. Yeah, still is probably. Well, yeah, in some ways. But I, I was very fortunate. I uh, I graduated from from school right at the moment. We called them microcomputers. I don't know that anybody even says that anymore. No. There were mainframes, minis, and micros. And yeah. the micros were these, some people at the, at the university had bought. Uh -huh. They call them black apples. Apples were originally you know, associated with Bell and Howell, from what I recall. Uh -huh. and, uh, and some people with some vision brought them out and said, we've taught you guys these mainframe languages, COBOL, right. Fortran. Fortran, yeah. But guess what? You got to learn how to do this. This is like my last semester in school. Uh, you got to learn how to do this. You got to do it on your own. And uh, so I graduated in the you know the first. That was seventy seven or so. Uh, let's see. It was it was late seventies. Yeah, I graduated in eighty one. So about that time, things were happening. And so I came into the field, in the accounting field. One of the first people who knew anything about these little tiny single user computers. They were single then. Yeah, I, I, didn't they even know that, I didn't even know those existed at that time. I took yeah. a computer class my last semester in college with, you know, where we did the punch cards and fortune yeah. and all that stuff. And, I did that too. And I thought it was just god awfully boring. It was <laughs> for me. It was yeah. like, wow, how can yeah. you do this? One I, mistake and you're completely screwed. I spent weekends punching on those punch card machines. <laughs> but you decks. But and, you could do it. You didn't mind it or didn't as your friend no, said it didn't it. you didn't hate it no, i i kind of liked it i, I you yeah. know you find in that kind of work the you're way perfect you, for it then i agree with him <laughs> the way you learn it is is making mistakes that might take two or three days to fix yeah well that don't mean anything no you know what yeah. i mean oh when i do over, know yeah when it's over somebody says well you should have done this and then you go well i'll never make that mistake again but you wasted a big part of your life that tedious part but um the microcomputers I, the reason i brought that up is I went, I be, I um, took the CPA exam, became a CPA, CPA, and worked for a accounting firm. But I was one of the first people in that knew about all these amazing new tools. And it wasn't long before I was kind of a go-to person. And I had a friend in the Bay Area that was starting a computer business. Oh wow! And and I only practiced public accounting for about three years, and then I was into the computer business, selling accounting systems and micro computers what we call them which is pc yeah what PC. company was that that you were working for at that time? well interesting enough i started my own uh for a number of years but then it became difficult to buy a lot of the equipment if you weren't associated with the franchise so i became associated with one out of phoenix mesa mm -hmm. called micro age mm -hmm. i don't know if you remember micro age mm -hmm. but micro age was real big in the arizona area in the southwest and nationwide there were computer land and different things but i, I remember Computerland was one of them. Uh, uh, Microage was fairly large. 
Was this like late 80s time frame? Yeah, now we're into the 80s. I did. I was just in public accounting for about three years. I was an auditor, and uh, and I started a business and then found I had to go run it mm -hmm. to make it work. Yeah. Th things weren't going well. I had to go back. I mean, I was doing both. I had to go down to the business and say, what's going on here? And, and then it took 10 years to get out of it. But to shorten the story, at the end of it, I had some means and capabilities. I sold the business and decided I'm going to do what I want now. Mm -hmm. And I went back to school. And what year was that? Uh, that would have been, let's see, um, early 90s. Okay. Was in the early 90s. And I went to the U and studied painting and drawing. University of Arizona? U University of Utah. Okay. We have yeah. RU, too. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say, wow, you went no. to the University of Arizona. That's really cool. The University of, yeah, we, call it, we call it. The, and so you're yeah. in your like mid-30s yeah, at this point right. in time? that's right. So you, I, you said, okay, uh, I'm having a m moment here that I need to change Well, I direction. heard that. I heard an aunt say, one of my aunts told my mother, he says, he's having a midlife crisis. Yeah. Thought, There's no crisis in my life. Yeah. I always want to do this. Yeah. You had the, the money to now do... Really, kind I had of some resources you, yes. to go do what I thought, you know, I always wanted to do. I, I didn't find it some some uh, uh, meltdown. I, I just found an no, exciting it's not, opportunty. Yeah, no, I, I totally understand. And, and I did the same thing. Saying. And you, when I was 32, I did it. So you were 32 yeah. when you decided to mm -hmm. do this. Yeah. Same age, same kind of thing. Yeah. And, and there wasn't any huge conflict. It was just None opportunity. Yeah, it was opportunity and going, uh, I still have time to do it. Yeah. For me, so, at least it was. Well, it, it wasn't as easy for me. I went back to school. I graduated and uh, then wasn't quite sure what to do with and it. And what was the degree in? Painting and drawing. Oh, studio art. Good. Oh, very good. Yeah. And were you thinking about being a fine artist at that point? Well, I, I would have liked to. I was thinking about it. But, you know, you learn a lot about art just doing it and uh, find you out do. how difficult it is that can be. And particularly as... You know, art can be so much more than uh, going to school. You know, you. Yeah. This this might be interesting to you, but I I had a professor, and I meant as a compliment. You know, sometimes you say the wrong things. <laughs> yeah, I know. But I I said to him, you know, when I graduated, I said this has been fantastic, but I'm sure glad they don't graduate doctors with this level of expertise <laughs> and he found they that. do by the way just uh, just to let you know <laughs> I, thought I would not want somebody working on me that knew as you yeah, know as do. i looked at the great artists you know i found i found very quickly in studying art that sometimes it was extremely discouraging because i learned much sooner what great art was than the ability to make great art yeah the what the difference was in in great art became very apparent to me. I yeah. could see the differences, and, and and then realized I was you know 500 or 700 paintings away from something that you you would really feel good about. Right, and and that commitment, I I, I find it just I don't know how the young artists even do it today, particularly in contemporary art when they're going to have to go through a long winter. Oh yeah of learning their trade and not having acceptance, not having that. Right. And lots of disappointments. Lots of disappointments. Yeah. How, how are they going to get through it and keep going and come out the other side, the great artists? And um, Well, I think some of it is they're young. Yeah. You that, know, that you are helps. a little older. So, you know, you're 32, yeah. you're done by your 36. Yeah. You have enough backspace to look and go, okay, I see what I've done. I know what's yeah. involved and I know what's going to take to get to this next level. And I know enough about art now. I can see it. I visually can see it. How long is it going to take me to get there? Yeah. Or do I get there? Well, that that's actually in my life. That's the big question. Yeah. I, I also was not sorry or sad about the other that I had 10 years of business experience. No, it's probably years. tremendously important. Yeah. Me, actually. And at that time, I mean, what happened that maybe can make this a little shorter was BYU was building a new museum of art. Mm. And I thought, they need me. Bingo. They need me. They need somebody who understands art and has a, uh, uh, a background in uh, painting who really understands um, fine art. And, and um, so I went down and met with them. The building wasn't even done. And uh, the first person I met with was the associate director. 
she was incredibly encouraging. She says, we do need you. Mm. And, uh, and then I met with some others and they found out, no, we, we really don't need you. <laughs> we already have people picked out. So I didn't get, I didn't, uh, get the job initially. In fact, there were three people in my position uh -huh. while I waited. And how, what year was this that they were building this that you were trying to get in? They were they they opened the museum in 1993. In 93, so you so were just this was literally been about 92, and I think I yeah. must have graduated in 91. And that was with a BFA. Yeah, I had a BFA. Yeah. So what did you do from that period of time when you after you graduated? What did you? Well, do? I did a number of things. I did a project with a company called Micron because uh, I had computer background. Yeah, I know that and, company. And I did some. That one was a very short one. I was just working kind of as a consultant. And uh, I did a few things like that, looking at maybe another business in case there wasn't a place for me. Right. Um, and then I went to work for, the company is now called Fluke. Uh, Fluke that makes scientific instruments. Yes, I, I know that. I know there's a paradox in the name. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're very, very good. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I know. Yeah, but uh, Fluke was, uh, and I was in a very specialized uh, segment of it for, I think, two or three years I worked for them. They were called Heart Scientific at the time they did temperature metrology. It was science, mm -hmm. but I was doing the marketing. I did uh, marketing and special projects for the company. And then one day, if the opportunity finally opened at BYU again. Uh -huh. And um, I got a call from them that they finally did. They finally did say, well, we'd like you to uh -huh. come down and talk to us. And, uh, and that was, by then though, that they had been uh, open for five years. Mm, so this is 88 or 98. Yeah, it was 98 yeah. when I started at BYU. And that That's period of it. time before you, when you're at Fluke and before you go to them, did you ever consider going, okay, things are breaking loose in computer technology. I'm sure you could clearly see it happening. Did you think about going to San Francisco or to do any of that with, you know, working for a company like an Apple or a Microsoft or any of that? Uh, well, those crossed my mind as you know, you're trying to figure out where you're going to go next, but uh, not not real seriously. I I, um, I was um, I was pretty much committed to where I was and and was hoping. I believed in this BYU thing. You love dark. I loved art, yeah. and I believed that's that where I would it. go. And all it took to get me to yeah. change course. One phone call. Just one phone call. Yeah. I saved the call slip. <laughs> I still have art. it. You love art. That's I still, amazing. I still have it. Yeah. I remember coming into work that morning, and I saw this name, and I thought, this has got to be it. Yeah. Why would they call me? Yeah. And, it, and it was. So and they said, come on down. We needed, and that was yeah. the, your position was what you have now or? No, I was actually the assistant director at that time. Mm -hmm. And it was over business operations and all of those kinds of things. I can't remember how long I was there, maybe four or five years, maybe six years. And then I was made the associate director, which was a more encompassing role mm -hmm. over all kinds of things. My role in that first five years expanded very quickly. And the associate director uh, position was just to catch up what I was already and doing. And what is your role? What is the role that you do? Well, I've, I've worked with two different directors and it's been uh, different in each. And I also served as the director for a year oh, wow. uh, in between them. Oh, and yeah, uh, I was the interim director uh, as we looked for a new director. There were, I originally worked with Campbell Gray. He's yeah, and he Australian. went back to Australia, right? Exactly. Yep. Yeah, Campbell. Yep. Campbell uh, went back to Australia, and Mark Magleby is now the director. Um, it was during Campbell's time. I was with Campbell for 15 years. Yeah. A long time, 14 years or so. And then uh, I was the interim director for a year, and then uh, Mark came. And um, um, so... Uh, Did they had to have, fill it with a PhD is for the directorship? Uh, they always... Well, the job description does ask for that. Yeah. Um, the, um, the, you know, BYU's uh, complicated in some ways who they can hire. And I don't know how much flexibility, but, but all three directors that we've had have had PhDs. Mm -hmm. The founding director was James Mason. He's the guy who kind of really got things going. He mm -hmm. was, his, his PhD though was in music. Um, but I don't care as long as the PhD. Yeah. yeah <laughs> he, and he was, he was a remarkable man. He, he was the one that had, a lot of the vision of uh, building an art museum. We had these collections that we talked about. We had the 
uh, Mahanra Young mm-hmm. uh, estate. And we had the Dixon collection, which is just phenomenal. Yeah. But we didn't have a, a, a place to take care of them and show them. And you have, and it's a beautiful building. I mean, it, it's, it's a stunning. They build a really nice yeah. building. And that was Jim Mason. Jim Mason studied museums and built what he thought was at the time the most functional and uh, uplifting. Uh, uplifting. It is uplifting. Yeah. He, I still, you know, I'm, I'm at the end of my career, but I, I never go into that building where I don't feel it's brand new and yeah. we just started <laughs> That's nice. and we got a long ways to go. Yeah. And I feel that the construction and everything was above, in many ways, above the quality of, of the other. I, maybe I shouldn't say things like that, but I've always felt an intense pride yes. in the uh, significance of the building and functionality, gallery space, storage. And below, yeah, the storage is it's, beautiful. It's just, uh, it, he did such a remarkable thing to put that on BYU's campus. And uh, I had the opportunity to come in after. I had no role whatsoever in, in that. I got there when things were up and running and rolling. Right. But I I felt incredibly fortunate to be a part of it, and then building an audience and a program. And, and what's your what would be your primary goals that you or functions that you have to do? Is it budgetary? Is it yeah, exhibits? I, I do. It, you know, um, I, I actually graduated originally from BYU with a, a master's degree in finance and, mm-hmm. and accounting, and and so for many years those were my primary responsibilities. Uh, looking for you know, ways to make sure the museum was funded and ongoing. And, uh, but I also got in very heavily involved in the exhibition program mm-hmm. and um, finding exhibitions and arranging contracts, negotiating loans. Uh, I've literally been around the world doing loans. And so, how do and, you find something like that? This is something I know nothing about. Do you, you know, search the the times. I mean, do you search looking for exhibits that's going on that already are kind of set and you go, we could use this here? Or do you go and talk to directors and curators across the country of what they have ideas of maybe what they're doing uh-huh. and snag it that way? Or how, do you, how does it's, it happen? It's a lot of different things. You know, you, you want to be aware of what other museums are doing. Mm-hmm. But one of the problems is if you use that approach, by the time you know about it, it's, it's done. Up. Yeah, it's locked up. You know, if you see uh, an exhibition, um, it's usually locked up. So it takes a lot of networking. Um, the directors have to be involved with other directors. That You've got to be on the radar if you want to be called. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, exhibitions come in a lot of different ways. They um, um, There are companies. Some of the early exhibitions that were run at BYU were uh, from a company called Wonders Mm -hmm. out of uh, Memphis. And um, they still exist? No, no, they don't. They did some, as far as I know, they don't. But they, um, we did one called Etruscans Imperial Tombs of China. Mm. Big exhibitions like that, a company will put it together and then they'll, they'll market it. So sometimes that happens. And from my experience lately, not so much anymore. Mm. There are still companies that do that. And we still buy exhibitions, but it's not to the scale that it used to be. Um, the what's more common now is is for various reasons a museum might renovate and they'll put their collection on the the road. We had one uh, in two thousand two that was from the Smithsonian American because they were doing renovations. Mm. And, they said, well, while we're closed. We'll take your, yeah, can we we'll, have it? We'll put some prizes, you know, it's... Uh, Does that come strictly from museum director, museum director, or yourself uh, making contacts with other directors, kind of knowing what's going on? And I would say that's the primary way yeah. it happens. The really good ones. If you want to be inside, right? you've got to have co- the confidence and trust. Um, it's, it's um, in some ways, this is like the question we talked about, I don't know few minutes ago why does somebody give something to a museum because the environment the security right the you know we're going to take care of it uh well you've got to establish yourself uh with that kind of trust right uh to be to be considered you've and then you can be worked with too i'm sure and, and because you, if yeah, you're you can it's like a star if you you may be yeah. a great movie star but if you're 
kind of a difficult jerk, to work with. You're yeah. difficult to work with. You, they don't want you. Yeah. And I'm sure yeah. that ha I'm sure that kind of gets out to the world at large, doesn't it? Like, oh, oh this museum. Is, oh, yeah. yeah. yeah this director is a real pain. And it does. <laughs> yeah, I figured about it. Uh, then, but another thing is we work with uh, contemporary. You know, we have we've had contemporary exhibitions and we work with contemporary artists. So you have to know the artists, not just directors, but you know, be aware of artists and right. and galleries. Right. Um, they can come from galleries. They can come from yeah, artists. I've had they, people con museums contact me and like, oh, what do you have? Yeah. And what can well, we from what I saw this morning, Mark, you have enough. Of course, there's a significant amount of that exhibition that uh, is your collection. Yeah. And you have a museum here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it's it comes in a lot of ways, and and also we curate out of our own collection. We try to think of ideas that would be uh, relevant for contemporary exhibitions. And um, and then we we try to, in some cases, like what I'm trying to do now, find uh, partners and people interested and see if, you know, in the future, we can put together something like what we've talked about a little bit right. with the Dixons. Right, because, and this is, I think, a good jumping off point to just talk about the, that collection because... It's an amazing collection. Let's just face it. It's people ask me all the time. Oh, you must have the most Dixons. Uh, you the, have the collection. I go. Well, there's a little place called BYU in Provo that has the collection. It's the it's the place. It's where all the the great works are. You have over a hundred pieces. You have all the major Depression era works uh, and others. And it was all most of it. Ninety five percent of it, I guess, was gotten in 1937 from when Harold R. Clark was able to buy the Dixon's collection basically of, you know, his main pieces for $3,700. Yeah, and, that's correct. And um, my understanding is Clark had seen, uh, just like you do, I bet, which is really interesting, he was a commerce dean, right? He was, he was in the... Yes, he, he was. was. He was in the business was, school. Yeah, he was in business school. He wasn't yeah. in the art, but he saw a... Um, uh, a uh, St. Louis mag or a newspaper featuring some Depression era pieces. He did, and I saw it for the first time today. Oh wow! It's in the exhibition. <laughs> I'd never seen it. Yeah, it's in the exhibition yep. at the uh, Scottsdale yep. Museum of the West. Yep. He saw that. Uh, I mean, that was actually quite thrilling for me. Yeah. To see, well, that's where it actually started. Yeah, that's it. That was that's the pivotal the piece. point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was that in your collection? Is that your no. piece? Oh well, yeah. that was thrilling yeah. and a big surprise. And I, though I do have the uh, studies for it, but uh -huh. the um, so he sees this and he calls Dixon up and says, "We'd like your stuff." And I think it was interesting because at that time frame too, when you think about this is you know probably thirty six when he's starting to negotiate this deal, thirty seven is when they buy it. But who wants to be reminded of the depression, which is still kind of going on yeah. at that time frame? Yeah. You know, most people didn't want those kind of paintings. Yet Harold R. Clark sees this and sees genius. And an opportunity, maybe too, but he saw genius for sure. He did. And uh And it is a surprise that yeah. you know, that somebody with his background would be able to read that yep. and uh understand that they were significant. Yeah. And so. that Dixon would work with him too. And, you know, and they had a really, they had a relationship, not only after, not only yeah. when he bought it, but after when he bought it, he, he, Clark yeah. bought some pieces from him too. And I know I found uh, a letter, I think, from Harold R. Clark written to uh, Edith Hamlin after his death uh, uh -huh. and talked about how important, he talked about how important Dixon was as a person and, a, and as somebody who, who fought for the underdog and, um, there was, and, and they, I know at one point there's a letter I also found, it's in my book, that where um, Dixon writes Clark and says, listen, you know, I don't want it to go to the Mellons or the Rockefellers. You know, I'd rather get less, basically, and have it go to the right place mm -hmm. where, where it gets seen, where it has merit. And that's why he ended up, they all ended up there, I think. You know, the money was important, clearly, but. It was, I think it was way deeper than that. Mm -hmm. And I think it was that relationship. I think so too. I think it was primarily the relationship. I think it's also his connection though with uh, the Southwest and Utah, even though we're North, uh, Southern Utah where he lived. Yep. All of it. He had experiences down there. Yeah. Um, and he traveled through the area. 
I had read that he had he had uh, said that someday he would come to BYU and speak. Yeah, my understanding has never happened. Yeah, he that letter did. is in there. I've read I've read yeah. that letter where he said he will come yeah. and talk. Um, and I think it was that was done around thirty nine forty. I think when that was uh-huh. you know when he was saying he would do it, but his health was starting to go. Yeah, and, you know. There was other things that yeah. happened as well. But yeah, he got to Utah first in 30, 1933. 33. Yeah. And um, he did like Utah. And he did like the Mormon people too. I, he did. Yeah. I have a letter actually. And that, so did the boys. That said, Yeah, they did. That said, the, <laughs> yeah. he wrote, you know, they're good people. They're nice yeah. people. Uh, I I think it must have been a combination of those things. And, and uh, Harold R. Clark was a very interesting person as well. And I think Dixon liked people like that. Did you know him, by the way? No, I I don't. I yeah. don't. I just have read about him. Uh, I've met his sons, and uh, um, I I would say it it was a really good day for BYU, though. I can't imagine uh, if we, did, you know, didn't have that. What what that's brought, not just the Dixon, but we've uh, we've we've done a number of Southwest shows because. We have the Dixon collection, yes, and it's it's been a since I've been at BYU, and I believe this is well. I'm I'm sure this is comprehensive, but the museum's about 26 years old now. Mm-hmm. This fall, um, we we've only shown uh, a substantial part of the ex, of his collection twice. Right, uh, we did a portrait show, which was smaller, but we did an exhibition called Escape to Reality. Yep. I was there for the opening. Yeah, Gibbs uh, wrote a book, I think. Yeah. yeah, Linda Linda Gibbs wrote the book, what the catalog on that, and um, uh, it's been a long time, and uh, we're looking at uh, doing it again. And uh, what I'm trying to do is to find a way to uh, uh, place Dixon to me in 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 the in the canon, you know, in in the place where. I think he really belongs. I think that his work is has held up better than many many yes. other artists. I think it's still extremely relevant. In fact, you know, in the beginning of our conversation, what we're talking about in uncertainty and uh, where are things going? Right. And is the is you know is the world coming apart? Or are we finally coming together? Right. That's exactly the the moment he he did this stuff. The yep. maritime strikes, the unrest, the uncertainty of the depression. Um, can you know? And I also spoke about well, how are these young artists going to make it? Well, try it during the depression, right? You know, you know. In fact, you know, and it, I think it was in your book, and you commented on that. You know that that uh, they were always concerned. How are we even going to make a living? Yeah, he only um, sold a couple dozen paintings from like twenty nine to thirty six. So maybe imagine you could, that. <laughs> you could verify this, but the story I've heard, I didn't, I haven't found it in any of the books, but. That when Harold R. Clark talked to him, uh, he went down there to buy the maritime strike paintings. Mm-hmm. He thought those would be good for the business school. Right. But I understand that Dixon hadn't sold the painting for a couple of years. Is that true? Well, it could be. I don't know if it's a couple of years, but he only sold a couple dozen in about uh, six years. So, so, you know, it, it's very, very few paintings. I mean, yeah. he made his living. He survived by doing PWPA for yeah. Boulder Dam. He got like 1800 bucks, about 10 cents on the dollar. Uh-huh. Uh, he did the Standard Oils Bulletins yeah. in 1930. He did the Golden Gate Bridge, all the drawings for that in um, 19... Uh, 1930 as well, and helped pass the those bond. Are the, yeah, he, he those helped. are in the exhibition. Yeah, I know, right? I know. They, they are absolutely amazing. You know, that's new information. I yeah. had, I had really never understood that till I read your yep your he, book. How important it was picking the color and yep. and doing those drawings. Yep, and, he got uh, Moro hired, who was the architect. He got Moro. He hired. got him hired because the the Strauss, who was the head engineer for it ask his assistant who happened to be Dixon's brother-in-law who should we get to get you know who do we need to to do the uh, the architecture and he says well ask Dixon he'll know Maynard will know Maynard huh. said you should do Irving Morrow he's a young uh-huh. guy but he's a really good architect let's get him uh-huh so they hired Morrow and then Morrow hires Dixon to do the drawings and then Dixon uh, also helps you know, with all the drawings they, they mm-hmm. put in the October 4th, uh, 1930 um, supplement for those for the papers to get the bond passed. So they get passed a $35 million bond on Dixon's drawings 
to get the Golden Gate Bridge done huh. during the height of the Depression, really. I mean, 1930 was really, well, it was really exploding at that point. In fact, Morrow and Strauss all go over to Dixon's studio to get the artist involved in passing when saying, don't go against this, we want to get uh-huh. it passed. The artists really weren't for that. They were like, well, we really don't want to see the, the you know, the, the natural beauty destroyed. But uh-huh. Dixon said, listen, you know, I, I'm for it. This is what it is. And so the artist said, okay, well, we're not mm-hmm. for it, but we won't be vocal about it. So imagine mm-hmm. how much things have changed when artists in 1930 can have influence with the people who are yeah. actually building it and have a say. And maybe we need more of that today, you know? Well... It turned out pretty good, <laughs> say. and that that was amazing for me to be able to see that. I'd read about it in your book, and and uh, I didn't know what was in the exhibition. Yeah, uh, but it's there. Yeah, we it's, tried to cover. Yeah. So we're talking about the the show that's in the uh, Scottsdale Museum yes. of the West, uh, Spirit West, and um, with Tricia Lozier, who's the co curator of it. Tricia really did, I, I've said many times, the heavy lifting for that show, getting all the pieces, really helping with the design, doing the design. And so we worked collaboratively and were able to get the pieces we felt that would really be important for that show, which BYU was on the top of my list. It's like, okay, these are the ones we want. If we can get any uh-huh. of these, we've succeeded. And um, Mike talked to me, Mike Fox, the director, and said, you know, this is what they required. And I said, do it. I said, they're very important. It's a key part of the puzzle. And you have to have at least one of those major depression era pieces, you know, to tell the story properly, regardless of what yeah. it takes. Yeah, it does have to be there. It and, is. Uh, and it is. And we were we were very happy to participate. And our um, head registrar, Trevor Waite, came down with them and he said, this is I mean, this is first class. It's it's what we were talking about before. You know, how do you get an exhibition? Well, you've got to have the right security, the right environment, right. the conditions and things. And he evaluated and said, they do. Yeah, do. they this, do. This is a great institution. And uh, and we're, we're thrilled that they're there. Yeah, it's it's um, really, uh, you know, it's a, without BYU uh, paintings in there, I don't think the exhibit is as good. It just wouldn't have been as good no. because it just misses a key component, not only of the exhibit, but also of what Dixon would have wanted. I mean, he yeah. wanted those pieces in an institution. He chose that institution. He could have done a lot of different things. I appreciate the compliment, but I might disagree with you just for a moment. Yeah, good. In that that uh, those pieces are essential, no question. You're absolutely right. Yes. But what I see when I see someone else do a Dixon exhibition is, yeah, well, there's more. There's more. You have to have Earth Knower in there. Yeah. You've got to have the uh, Shapes of Fear. You've got to have the uh, Mustangs. Yes. Wild Horses Nevada, Nevada, 1927. Those pieces, BYU, a concern we've had, it's great to have a big chunk of work. But as I've mentioned a couple times now, now you own the responsibility of it. Yes. Now we have a huge responsibility to uh, make sure that Dixon's legacy is remembered and understood. Yes. And uh, um, and there's a bit of a disadvantage to an artist if all of the works are in one place. This is true. But here's the good news: they're not. No, he. The, he some of the real prizes. Yeah, they're out there. Uh, are are in private collections. Shapes of Fear, which I think is yeah. maybe the most remarkable of all of them to me. Uh, my, my, me too. And I own maybe. the big study for it, so I'm a little biased. Uh, but Maybe of all of them. And it's the yeah. one today as we began our conversation. Yeah. Which one represents what's going on right now? Yeah. I can't. Yes. I'm thinking Dixon. And maybe that is keeping me from seeing something else. But if I were to pick a piece today yeah. from my background, what piece is what's going on right now? Shapes of Fear. Yeah, that's right. What's in? What's under those robes? Yeah, that's what right. What is coming? The despair. The despair. So this is a figurative piece with these hooded robe individuals yeah. that are very ominous. And when Dixon did this in 1930, when he first painted this, he said that he felt like there was a vice around his neck as he was painting it. And he was. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and he was very despondent. Um, and he paints this. And he answers it into the um, San Francisco Art Association in 1931. And he wins uh-huh. the most popular prize. B. 
beating out people like who were in their hopper and uh, yeah, you know, you know um, uh, the Mexican artist uh, D- Rivera yeah. and uh, Dasberg and all these people, and then he goes on in 1931, uh, 32 to win the Harold R. Clark or the uh, uh, Harry Ranger Award, and uh, in the 104th National Academy of Design. Um, exhibition which is considered to be the greatest painting of the year and he wins uh-huh. that yeah in 1932 and he gets 1500 dollars, and he says that money saved my life is that right saved his life so that you're right that painting is exceptionally important and it ends up in the I, smithsonian institute's collection i've never heard that what you just said yeah. that he felt like a vice was on his neck around his neck this week Tell yeah. me something more relevant than yeah. a vice on right. somebody's neck. Yeah. And somebody that can't breathe. Yeah. You know, that's it's... exactly right. And well, I'm glad you I'm glad you mentioned yeah. that and I'm glad you see it because that's how I feel. I feel the work has transcended now, you know, time and has emerged as just as relevant, maybe yes. more. Um, if you want to see images of somebody who uh, just felt what was always intrigued me about art, and what I find my expectation from as art, an artist is show me something that will help me either understand or something new. And right. I don't know of an image more than Shapes of Fear that uh, uh, could convey what's happening on this day today. I, I don't know what's going around the country today. Uh, but I know what happened yesterday. Right. And it's still happening. Right. Well, Dixon yeah. was another thing that was really interesting about him is he was a big advocate for Native rights when Native uh-huh. rights were not considered to be important. Uh-huh. You know, he fought against, you know, the tyranny. He fought against Indian schools, you know. Yeah. And, um, you know, 1924 is when Indians got the first uh, mm-hmm. opportunity to vote in America. Not hmm. until 1924. Wow. So, and, and Dixon, along with Charles Loomis, these were mm-hmm. individuals that were really part of, you know, changing the dialogue for Native American rights. So again, I mean, he really is, I think, pertinent. Uh, he was doing it early on when no one really cared, quite honestly. And he lived mm-hmm. with, you know, the Hopi, and he stayed out with, you know, Hubble, and he spent, you know, went to twenty-two different tribes. And I mean, he really, I think, had a great appreciation for not only. Uh, the people, but also their artwork, and understood that they were the true, you know, bearers of the artwork. And Earthenor, which is the other one we talked about, yeah. is again one of these that says, you know, from the land to the people, they yeah. know. And uh, so, yeah, yeah, I, I think you know these times and his work also allow us, to, you know, question, you know, the things that are important. There's a, a story I think it was in Linda Gibbs' book about the uh, chief in Taos, Antonio, is it? Mm-hmm. Antonio well. that said, you know, things are tough where you live. You can come and live with me. I have corn. I have, yep. you know, the, the idea is that uh, the Southwest and uh, traditional ways of life and things yep. uh, can be an escape or a survival. Yeah. A survival. And, and, the, and they, they pose the question, well, what is it we really need? Right. What, what do we really have to have? And Dixon, I think, his work is is uh, exploring those things and those people. Yep. And um, what I'm really trying to say is I find it all extremely um, timely and relevant. And and I'd like to see it exposed to uh, a much broader um, audience. audience than Western. And I don't think it's... Well, that uh, same letter that you're talking about? which I've seen. Uh-huh. Dixon also goes on to say, you know, what would Hearst think of this man giving me food and lodging for free? Yeah. So the same uh, kind of thing we're doing now, you know, uh-huh. what is, you know, big corporations and, you know, the people that have everything and the people that have nothing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what would that mean to, you know, the people who have money and don't care that this man would do this. Yeah. So it's still very pertinent. And I agree. Dixon should be exposed to a greater audience. And you have the ability, which I love, to potentially make that happen. I think if we could get some help, yeah, we could make it happen. I think there's some really important people. Um, um, that's why I'm here today. 
that have uh, spent a lifetime on this as their central thing. I've, I've done a lot of things at BYU, lots of different exhibitions. In fact, the last count, I don't know what it is now, but it's been a while since we counted them. It's over 160. Wow. Different things. Wow, that's a lot. And, and only, you know, in my involvement, two of them with Dixon. Um, as, as the primary. And is that over 25 years? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Years. A long yeah. time. Yeah, that is a quarter of a uh, century. Yeah. <laughs> it is. <laughs> but there are people, what I was going to try and say, there are people who have, who have had their thumb on the pulse, so to speak, as a doctor would do mm -hmm. during all this time. And that's what they do. And they know the collectors and they know the important pieces and they know the things like a vice yeah. on his neck. They know those things. Yeah. The people who, who've had to do 160 other things may not know. So I don't, I don't want to go into this project without involving the people who can really inform, who would really understand how to put uh, Dixon's work where I think it belongs. And, and then I think it'll be readily accepted. And what needs to be there? What stories need right. to be told? There are certain things that do yeah. need to. Because sometimes yeah. it's the smallest pieces that can be... <laughs> you know, pivotal yeah. uh, in the story, whether, you know, and when I think about that, I think of Dixon's little portrait drawing that he, you know, sent to Remington, you know, yeah. when he's 15 years old. The one know? in the show. Yeah, First one, one in the, the show, show, you know, that yeah. was critical to his formation of who he was and what he was. I'm trying to recall, is that in your collection? Yeah, yeah. How, how in the world did you get that? Well, we had it in the museum for 25 years, actually, hanging, and uh, I was fortunate enough to buy it from John and, Dixon, well, you bought it from yeah, John. Uh huh. Yeah. Wow. And so Dixon clearly liked it too and hung on to it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've literally had that piece uh, for 25 years showing it, and I was fortunate enough to you know be able to add it to the Art Museum collection. And they wanted it seen too. Clearly, John really, I think, felt it was important that pieces like that, you know, end up in museums and get seen. Uh huh. They were. They were. They were both interested in that. Yeah. And, we worked with them for a number of years. Yeah, and, Daniel uh, and John. Mm -hmm. And um, they were uh, both, uh, they both realized the contribution that both of their parents made. Yeah. And they both realized the cost that it came to them personally. Yes, that's right. And uh, Being uh, the children of very creative, yeah. strong-willed people is not yeah. an easy task. But you know what's interesting, uh, Mark, that I sensed, I had a chance to, to uh, meet with, uh, John, I, I don't know how many years ago, and but he was expressing, you felt the pride he took, although he, he was anxious to tell you the pain. Oh, yeah. But the pride that he felt in what his parents, both of them, had accomplished in yeah. their lives. And uh, How could you not, I guess, really? How could you not? On the other hand, some of the things he told us were so horribly painful. Yeah, the boarding the school was boarding really, schools really and, a tough yeah, one and for he them. He described, you know, that they would, the fear that him and Daniel would have when they, their parents would say, oh, we've met some new people we want to go to, we want you to meet. And then they would know, right? oh. Yeah, we're gone. Are, are we going to go with you? Or we, yeah. And, and they, they'd leave them. Yeah. And and they didn't know how long. He described those. But the more important thing was, I think, through their lives, they worked through that and said, yeah, but look what they did. Yeah. And maybe it came at a cost, but... Uh, I think it did. I think, at least I can talk for John, I think, to some extent, but I th he got to a point, John did, in maturity, that he realized life's tough and there's a lot of yeah. tough decisions. And um, I don't, you know, when, when Dixon was around, he was there. He was present. He was... He was all yeah. engaged. But the problem was he wasn't there, there a lot because yeah. he would go out for six months at a time sometimes. Yeah, so you wouldn't tell him how long he'd be gone. You know, yeah. I mean, Dorothea was just yeah. like, well, he's gone. He'll be back. And you yeah, know. imagine the communications, you know. Well, there was none. I guess there were the expectation now is, you know, in a few hours, if you haven't heard from somebody, you start getting right. going, what, what's going on? But he, he might say, I'll be gone for a few weeks. And it's a few yeah. months. And he's going out into places that are dangerous. Yeah, we don't you know, know where he is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a story in the, I think it's in Thunderbird Remembered, where the boys threw their sleeping bags, bags up on a ledge and there were things up there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what they remember from their childhood. You yeah. Know, you could be off in the desert somewhere and never come back. 
Um, I'm trying to think of the guy, into the famous guy. Ruiz, Everett Ruiz. Ruiz. I actually Ruiz. wrote uh, my yeah. last novel that I wrote was about a Maynard Dixon yeah. painting and Everett Ruiz. Yeah. And we still don't know what happened to him, right? Well, if you read my novel, you can I'll have see to how that. I thought it. What do you, what do you well, think? Well, it's happened? a novel, so I'm not going to blow the novel. Yeah, but, but, but that's what we're but, talking yeah, about. And, you walk out in the desert. And Dixon wrote, by the way, a poem called At Last, which is considered yeah. to be his great poem, right? Yeah. He wrote that after Ruiz disappeared. Is that right? Yeah. So that was probably done for Ruiz. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Because Ruiz's mom was, she actually wrote him a letter. I found the letter, saw the letter that, you know, she's asking him, you know, what do you think? Where is my son? Because he, he had met him in 32. And um, Dixon said, oh, don't worry about it. You know, he's a wanderer. You know, he'll be back. He'll touch base. Uh -huh. But, you know, and that was, I think, in November of 34. And by, you know, 35, Dixon realized that, you know, something had happened. And uh, he, he knew he was not going to return. And that's right after that, he writes that at last. Now, we don't know for a fact it was done for Ruiz, but it was done for Ruiz. Huh. You know, so. Well, that's that's kind of the point of it. And uh, and I think that's also you're helping me build my case. We need people who understand these things. We, we do have the collection. You do. And we do have a responsibility. And I feel we do need some help. There are a lot of resources some very specific, yes. I would say four or five, that uh, with the right uh, partnership and input that we'll be able to do something that I think we'll be very proud of and that uh, John and Daniel Wood and, and Maynard and Dorothea, I, want, I, I believe we have to include Dorothea oh, absolutely. and Edith. Absolutely. As, uh, as what I found as, um, at the exhibition this morning, I saw that 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 whole big story is is told has to be told by all the characters. That's right, and uh, and that's um, why we included in that exhibit, you know, yeah. paintings by Edith, you know, yeah. a, a painting that she did of of Dixon, and we have Dorothea Lang photographs. Yeah, and you know they were critically important. And Edith, you know, if she didn't have the torch for Dixon after his death, like she did, he might have been lost to history at some point. Is that right? I really feel that. She was such a promoter and so concerned about him, you know, succeeding, his legacy succeeding. Well, that that's interesting. made a huge, I think, made a huge impact. And huh. um, she, you know, she was great. And John had told me on more than one occasion how wonderful a person she was. She told me she, that too. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it, and, and of yeah. course, Dorothea had big influence as well in both ways. He had influence yeah. on her early on, I think. And then I think she had a tremendous influence on him during the Depression. You know. Yeah, I've always believed there was such a moment of synergy. As I read your book and uh, and and Linda's and and um, Dan Haggerty's book, yeah. you know, they're, they're all tell pieces of this, this story. But the one that I, I like to believe in, and I love your comment, how true it is, but it seems that she was inside the studio taking society portraits. Maybe yeah. that's not the right term. No, that's but, what they were. Uh, she was taking portraits of important people and, yep. and making a living doing that. And he was out wherever. And the two things, you know, she started walking through the streets in San Francisco, seeing the riots and the police yep. and the problems and started saying, this is really, there's really something I could do here. And... Um, and, and I've always kind of believed her and heard, it was my idea that his influence of being out and seeing real things, real people, yeah. not staged, uh, influenced her to go out and do her best work. And her social conscious, um, you know, Maynard was looking for all these things in the desert. And she was basically saying, they're right outside the door here in yeah, San that's Francisco. Right. That's right. There's, there's things happening right out the window that are are representative, and that's how we got Forgotten Man. Yeah, and um, that's right. A destination nowhere, nowhere well, to go. Yep. You know what was really contemporary uh, current events that were heavy on people's minds, and of course, Shapes of Fear, as we've talked about, and then the, then the roots again. You know, the roots were Earth Knower and Silent Hour, and and yep. he's, he's looking at these things, saying, "Well, there's a timelessness in the Southwest." They have something, they have a gift 
that you you if you understood how other people live, right, you might live a lot better yourself. And if especially you, if you live with them, you yeah, really like get a did. sense which he did, which he did. Yeah, he's real. Yeah, no, he he you know, and he was at the right time, also yeah. to make a mark that you know everybody has their time, and there's these components of people who are super important. You know, whether it's you know a Matisse or a Pollock or uh-huh. Dixon, but you know. Dixon <clears throat> lives from the time before we have uh, Custer's last stand. He's born in 1875. Yeah. He lives through the great uh, earthquake of 1906. Loses first well, America. Yeah, he goes through Ameri- the first World War One. He lives through the pandemic, which almost dr- he almost quit painting at that time frame because of those kind of pressures. Really uh-huh. interesting. Then he lives through the Depression, through World War two through the nuclear age and Uh so he goes from no electricity and natives are still completely free Mm -hmm. to the nuclear age through them to to that time frame and and he captured it during that whole time frame and Mm -hmm. how many artists do that including doing the golden gate bridge and boulder dam two of the three most important industrial revolutionary events yeah, symbols that happened in america other than the yeah. empire state building he got two out of the three and he was involved well in that's it. interesting and he lived in new york too yeah and he lived in new york and knew Studied all these in people new york. Mm-hmm. and knew yeah. all about that so he is yeah he is a very interesting person i think you and i both feel that you know the east is a place that he needs to be seen you know from an exhibit standpoint in a major museum would be I, very I important. feel that too i feel that uh i i I think if we could find a, a museum that was interested in participating in the project, I, I, I kind of personally feel it'd have to be New York, and the other one is San Francisco. Yeah, his hometown, not his hometown, but yeah, it is. but but he, that's where he was. Yeah, the character of Maynard Dixon. Yeah, and he lived there a long time. He lived he there a long time. Studio for a very long time. And he time. had a persona there, and he yeah. had a. Uh, he did have a persona. He had a get up. Yeah, and, you know, it's true. <laughs> yeah. And you look at somebody yeah. like Georgia O'Keeffe, you know, and yeah. they just did a show on her outfits, you know. Dixon cut a very unique figure, you know, he, with this Texas Stetson hat and his yeah. high boots and his cane, you know, sword cane. You know, he, it was a sword cane. It was a sword cane with a Thunderbird on top. Yeah. I mean, he was not without uh, making sure people knew who he was. Yeah, you know when he in walked San Francisco. You know, in San Francisco and in New York City too, so he was you know he he was, had that character in New York as oh, well. Oh yeah, absolutely, huh. yeah, absolutely. I mean, he knew Buffalo Bill. He met with Buffalo yeah. Bill. You I know saw your card. Yeah. <laughs> that was actually thrilling in the in the exhibition today. Yeah, and and to he see. you know he knew Charles Russell came and visited him in 1908. Oh. You know, so he you know. He knew all of the things, uh, what was going on in America. He was very tuned in to what was contemporary art and what was going on and the concerns with it, too, and how to deal with it. So, uh-huh. yeah, he's got, the, he's got the chops from a historical standpoint, uh-huh. from a painting standpoint, and BYU has the paintings from yeah. an exhibit well, standpoint. That's another thing I think to comment on is uh, uh, I, I thought you saw it clearly in your book. I think I mentioned to you that I... Uh, I had a conversation a few years ago with Michael uh, Dutchman at the uh, Briscoe. Yeah. Yes. And um, we were looking at uh, contemporary Western art and pointing out, you yeah. know, there's a Dixon follower, there's a Dixon. And I, that's no discovery to me, and I don't think it is to anybody in the field either. Right. Because I've heard, you know, very significant artists say, you know, I, I study Dixon. Right. And, but but that is something I think that's well known. He's a painter's painter. If you want that's to right. learn to paint, you look at Dixon. Yeah. And so many people um, do it now. Now, if you want to go a step further and say, well, who who was a painter's painter to Dixon? I'm not sure. Yeah, that's a. I well, don't think that's as clear. Well, well, I think the first person for sure would have been Frederick Remington. Remington was an inspiration. Yeah. He was an inspiration, um, and, but it, 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 in the sense that, you know, Remington tells him in a letter, you know, in, in um, 1890, you know, it's fine to be an illustrator. It's a good profession. It's an honest profession. You don't have to have an education. Yeah. I didn't, but it would help if you do, you know, that follow your own truths. Go to nature. 
Don't follow other people's ideas. Use your own. And so his, uh -huh. you know, those settings that he was given right off from the, you know, the greatest illustrator and probably painter of his yeah. of that time frame was that. So Dixon did that. He followed he got his commission. He, fo he followed his own, you know, his own yeah. rules, his own. He painted from nature and he tried to be a true American voice. And was. I mean, there are bellows, I think, influenced him. If you look at the way he did, he, you know, because Dixon does this dynamic symmetry with his paintings. It's, yeah. it's, a, uh, it's not exactly dynamic symmetry. It's a, it's a form of it. Uh -huh. But Bellows, who was Robert Henry's, you know, disciple, and, he right. knew, and of course he knew Bellows and Henry. If you look at those boxing paintings and then you look at, you know, scabs, you'll see the, you'll yeah. see, you'll scabs. see it. Yeah. Again, if yeah. you wanted to find a painting, Today, yeah. yeah, that uh, is relevant. Yeah, scabs. It's, yeah, no, it's so true. Scabs yeah. or Dorothea Lang's um, photograph of migrant mother. One. Well, my, I was thinking of the policeman. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. that's the greatest one. And you just see yeah. the feet too. Also, there's one yeah. where they just you see the feet. Yeah, in, yeah. But the cop I, with the. <laughs> I I agree with you completely. I think he got his commission and his inspiration and endorsement. Yes. Somebody said, "Hey, you can do this. Yes. This is remarkable. This right. little drawing you've done." But um, if I were to look at inspiration, I say, well, wh wh where did he where did he find his style from? I find similarities in artists. I don't think he had a, as as much association like Hopper. Yeah, no. I think I think they they remind me more of Hopper. Yeah. But as far as I know, these were totally separate careers. These were oh, yeah. people looking at. No, he wasn't looking stuff. at Hopper, and Hopper is a little younger than him anyway. You know, yeah. Bellows is the only one I can really see in form for yeah. his depression era pieces, just like, in those. But maybe contrast that. You don't need to agree with me, but contrast that. How many artists could you find that you say, well, where, where did you learn that? Dixon. Yeah. And if you look at Dixon and say, where did you learn that? Well, I see some. Yeah. Nobody invents everything. No, that's you know, right. Everybody's only a half a step off. Right. But it's fairly unique. It is. And I don't. And very original. And I don't see anything in the, my writings where I can go, oh, this is, you yeah. know, this is somebody. For instance, Charlie Russell, he really looked up to Charlie Russell for his costumes because uh -huh. he felt Russell really understood getting it right for the costumes of, uh -huh. you know, the yeah, cowboy dress. Yeah, and the, and, the, and the dress of the Native Americans. And so he respected that, and uh -huh. he and Dixon really worked on that. And one of the reasons in 1917 he wanted to go spend time with Russell is to find out how he was doing things and what he saw and how he did uh -huh. the, those kind of things. Completely Dixon's own thing, but he, you know, Russell definitely he saw something in yeah. that part of Russell's repertoire, and you know, so I think Dixon would see things and and make notes, mental notes. Uh, he was very smart. So, uh -huh. you know, he was a person who was very intelligent and could retain things quickly. Um, but, you know, he was a unique individual. And yeah. He had yeah. a skill set onto his own. I mean, you know, he could do all these great drawings in, in literally minutes. And Dorothea used to say just to watch his facile hands moving so quickly. You know, it was just a joy to see those kind of things. Yeah. And he didn't need a camera. You know, he's married to Dorothea, but he doesn't need a camera because he has it in his head and his fingers. And he can create it in the moment. Yeah. I was speaking a few days ago to the Binghams at yeah. the Thunderbird Foundation, and they recounted a story that uh, I'm not sure where I read it. It might have been in your book about how he went to school with them. And had him tell a story. He had a long roll of paper. Yeah. As they told the story, he drew the story. Yep. He would do that with John so and the just, kids. Yep. Yeah. Just, we've got this story. It, almost like improv comedy. You know, yeah. where somebody says, yep. okay, you're this and you're this yep. and you're this. And you got to do it right now. Yep. He, and, and he could do it. He'd he roll was, out a big piece of butcher paper and he would yeah. just start doing cowboys yeah. and Indians. Have you, do you know of anything like that that survived? They do, there are some that are, just survived. Um, Collectors? My understanding, yeah. I haven't seen them, but I know they, that there are some that I think. Wouldn't that be survived. something yeah, to I find know, one? Right? <laughs> uh, at least to publish it. Yeah. Uh, that's so intriguing. And it really shows the gift that he had, the, the, uh, the vocabulary he had in his mind, the visual yes. vocabulary. That he had all the pieces. You just have to tell him what it is you want to see. Yes, I find that interesting about him too. Is that he would go out and spend all his time, do sketches, and then paint in the studio. Yeah, um, but kind, he, of, he, kind of like the, the romantic um, paintings, uh, Art Bierstadt and those that came out west and then went back. 
painted these phenomenal paintings back east of yeah. Yosemite and things they'd seen. So he would, yeah, he would do drawings and he would do little paintings, but sometimes he would actually paint a big painting right in the in the place. He did that in the Tehachapi's Dear Heaven, which Dear one, Heaven. yeah, which is an amazing painting. Do you know where that one is? Oh yeah, I sold it. You did? So, yeah, I know exactly where it is. And he painted that outside. He had it hung to a couple of boards, uh -huh. uh, you know, uh, and the wind was so whipping, it was hard for them to paint. Is and, that right? And, yeah, so he painted a lot of that outside, but usually you'd go to the studio and work on it. I gotta ask you this because on, on that one, don't you see some Grant Wood in that? Oh yeah, of course. I, I think, now who preceded who? In, in, in well, I, I think Grant Wood is a little uh, later uh, than Dixon. Not a lot, uh -huh. though. Now, I, I'm not inferring in any way that Grant Wood saw that. Oh, yeah. But those hills and perspective, it's almost a Degas perspective of, yeah. of well, I wasn't expecting a, a drone view. You know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? Well, and, and that's something that Dixon did. I mean, uh, early on and was, I mean, that's how they passed the, the imagery that he did for the Golden Gate Bridge was you know, an eye view. He never, yeah. he was never in a plane on top. I don't think Dixon ever was in a plane ever. And um, Wow, that is an interesting you know, perspective. I don't think he ever yeah, did Yeah, those that, Golden he, Gate ones are all down, every one of them. Yeah. Yep. And he did that on a lot of different paintings that he did that. One that your, would be interesting. One in your collection. Ex explore. Fact, like that. For Zion, that one that looks down with the rider and they have the big Zion yeah. clips, same way. He was probably one of the first to do that, quite frankly. Uh, you know, they remind me, the creativeness of the perspectives reminds me of Degas. I mean, when you look at the Degas and say, how could anybody? No, you know, you see something a thousand times from one perspective. Right. And you see that for maybe you were in a box seat or something and you see it differently once or twice. But then to create it, the yes. time it takes to create it, you have to know it. And uh, right. Um, and th that must come from his his process of spending six months out somewhere yeah. and then coming back saying, I have all the pieces, I can put them together the way I want to. And he absorbs the landscape, right? He looks at the landscape. Yeah. You spend time really absorbing and looking and living yeah. and breathing the landscape, it gives you a sense of what it is. And it's not just showing up and going, oh, okay, no, you've lived in it. And I think, yeah. you know, he, you know, when he used to, he went through that channel many times from Sausalito in 1906 when they have the great earthquake, you know, everything's destroyed. He ends up going to Sausalito and he, you know, commutes back and forth. So he, uh -huh. you know, and I guarantee you when he's sitting on that, you know, commute, that little boat ferry, that uh -huh. he's looking at the land, you know, he's huh. absorbing it and seeing it and smelling it and feeling it. Yeah. You know, so, well, so it, it's, it's remarkable. <laughs> turned into a Maynard Dixon talk and I didn't expect yeah. it to, but, well. but who better than to talk to it about when uh -huh. somebody who represents, you know, the collection, you know, the, it's the gold standard of where everything is. And, um, you know, anybody that's out there listening that has the power to be, you know, get in contact, especially if you have those East Coast connections, because there are some major museums that this would be appropriate to show, yeah. in, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, Grant Woods has had his day, right? There's people that have had their day on the East Coast and major East Coast museums. And I do think that Dixon, you know, there's... Whitney or the uh, Guggenheim or, you know, there are places that it deserves. I mean, right now, as we speak, Dorothea Lang is having her second show at the Met or at the um, Modern. Mm -hmm. You know, it's closed, unfortunately, because of the corona. But, you know, she's been there in 65. She was there and she's there now again. So and they're intertwined as no one else could be, really. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. Uh, what interesting people. So what else is going on with the university, the art museum? Anything interesting? You guys are closed, I assume, for some period of time? We are closed. And I think that's the biggest project now is to say, what, what's next? How do we read this? How do you do it safely? How do you make it happen? What will it be? Yeah. You know, the question is, well, what, what is the future? Right. Um, what changes um, will we all be? having to accommodate in uh, um, the future. And uh, I think uh, that's what has to happen next. But um, these types of exhibitions take years. We've had some at BYU. I worked on one for over 10 years. Wow. Um, before things really started to happen. Yeah. And uh, 
if you want to do something significant. Yeah. It it takes a lot of people. It took us three years on this one. Yeah, three threes. Yeah. That's that's wow. But um, um, I'm hoping in a few years we'll be able to uh, put something together that's worthwhile in San Francisco and New York and yeah somewhere else where um, um, you know people can see it and it, he can have the credibility and uh, relevance that. I think will be useful. I think people will oh, look yeah. at him and say, "That that tells me more, you know, about myself. Right? It's things I didn't know, or th or the way I see it, and the and the hope. There's hope in it too. That he made it. Yeah. It wasn't the depression that got him. No. Um, it was the smoking actually. The smoking. That's yeah. What got him. <laughs> That's a good message. Too. Yeah. But um, uh, as an artist, he made it. He survived. Oh, this was pro that was his proudest thing. <laughs> I think one of the two, but the fact that he was able to survive as an artist his entire career and, and be a painter and make a living and not do anything else. He really thought that was a significant element. And, and, it is. And it is. Trust me, I know it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure you do. You deal with artists constantly. Yeah. Well, even in my own life, yeah, I, I realized yeah. I had more to contribute in other ways. Uh, it, it is really a remarkable thing when somebody yeah. uh, spends it. a lifetime. Pays the price, yep, and emerges with um, a body of work that is meaningful long after they're gone, yeah, and can be explored in new context and new understanding. Yeah, um, the context is really interesting that you brought today. You know, as far as those paintings, and I hadn't put them together, but you can really see it, boy. Yeah, you know, especially when he gets back from Boulder Dam and. 34 and the maritime strike is going just full on, you know, and you have bloody Thursday. Yeah. You know, you have 10,000 people march on Market Street, you know, on July 5th, I think it was. And people were killed, weren't they? Yeah, two people were killed. Two. Yeah. Two died. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah, it sounds familiar, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, well, you were super kind to come and spend time with me. I know I kind of shanghai you a little bit. And I, it's not a problem. But I was very anxious to meet you. Yeah. Um, it's just extremely well known and respected in this Thank field. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's I'm I'm looking for associations like that that can tell us and inform us in ways um, like you've done today. Uh, just that was worth the trip. Oh, we'll have more discussions. There's no Great. doubt about that. Great. I'm glad to hear that. Very good. And we will see you probably next time I see you is going to be up. I want to come up and see the collection. I make a trip every so often. Just, uh -huh. I don't, you know, I don't let anybody, you know, I call and say I'd like to see it. And they're always kind. That's one thing that I've always told people. I said, if you'll, if you'll call the university, if you'll call the art department, and tell them, you know, you're a serious person that you're really interested in. And they'll, they'll probably take you down to the, let you see some of the storage area. And, um, you know, maybe not right now, but, you know, when the corona stuff has passed, I've always found that there, that, that the university has always been very giving a lot, letting people see things. Because mm -hmm. you can't have that much up. I mean, no, we have a responsibility to do that. We typically will bring things up. In fact, with notice... It can be about anybody. We have a, a special viewing area. You tell us what it is yeah. you'd like to see. We have uh, over 18,000 works in the wow. collection. And That's so, That's you know, at a, any given time, there's only a few you can show, which means if somebody needs to see something, um, let us know. We'll bring it up. Yeah. We'll let you see it. There you go. So... If anybody listened to the this entire podcast, that was the most important part of it. You can go and see this amazing collection, yeah. and uh, I'll also try to put up on the YouTube part the, or, or at least my image of shapes of fear that I have for that drawing, so people can see what it looks like, and maybe my drawings of shapes of uh, pickets as well, and and uh, scabs and scabs as well. Yeah, so people can get a sense of what. Uh, takes another one's on. free speech. Yeah. That's one of your great ones. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. Good. Another maritime. Yeah. So good. Oh yeah. No, you got, you got yeah. them all. <laughs> Harold did, did a really good job for us. Yeah. We, uh, oh yeah. We, we do appreciate it. And so that. you are too. You've spent oh. a, you've dedicated your life. You could have done a lot of things and you chose art and, or art chose, chose you one of the two, but clearly you're an artist. I can tell. I can, well, thank you. I can always thank tell you. an artist. <laughs> it's, oh, a, you are. it's a wish. You had, now you have yeah. the passion. I can see it in your eyes. I can hear it in your voice. 
and uh, you know you're a part of the brotherhood and sisterhood of art. So well, thanks. Yeah. That means a lot from you. <laughs> All right, Ed Lind, thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. And we'll see you uh, in uh, Utah. Great. Thanks. Right. Thanks. Sorry, okay. It's so hot in here. No, it's okay. It's just fine. We need your support for the Medicine Man Gallery channel, so make sure to click the subscribe button and tap the little bell icon to be notified when we upload a new video, which we do every morning on Wednesday and Friday. See you soon.